yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fed with the church of the town. Uh, uh, Kratos will give the, the special lecture on um, on Wednesday. So first of all, Wan's back in the back. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. Thanks for being here. All right, so before we get into today's topic, um, let's go through the final things on the administrative uh, side of things. So the final submission on Project 2 will be uh, next week on Monday, May 1st. Um, I still owe everyone feedback. Uh, I, that's on my to-do list for this week. The final exam presentation will also be next week, but at the end of the week on Friday, May 5th, 5.30 p.m. Let's do it in this room, and then I'll send an email or a post on Piazza of, like, if anybody has any dietary restrictions, and we'll order pizza for everyone. Okay? Again, it's not like a, it's supposed, it's supposed to be like a lighthearted fun thing. Like, hey, here's this cool stuff we've done, and we, and we celebrate it. The final exam, which Wan has just posted on uh, Piazza and GradeScoop, that was going to be due the same day as May 5th as the final presentations, but I'd rather have you guys do an awesome job at the final presentations. So I bumped that to be Sunday, uh, May 7th, due at, at midnight. So you're going to submit it on, on GradeScoop as the PDF. Um, but then you, you, you're allowed to use ChatGPT to write your exam. Um, but obviously, if you, if you ask ChatGPT to write it, you don't read it, and you submit it, like it's, you're not going to do well. Because I, 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 I put the final exam question into ChatGPT yesterday. Um, I, I, don't think, I, don't have, I don't have a screenshot, sorry. Um, I'll post on Piazza, but I, it gets it wrong. So it says, in particular, uh, when it starts talking about OLAP systems in the 2000s, is this, it says HStore, which is the system I worked on when I was in grad school, uh, you know, took advantage of multiple cores and made, trans, or made uh, analytical, data, analytical workloads run faster, which is the exact opposite of what HStore was. HStore was about making transactions run faster, not analytical queries. So if you blindly submit whichever chat TV gives you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be wrong. Right? So, but you can use it as a starting point to help you uh, flesh things out. Now, we're going to do a little experiment. So, I don't care whether you use ChatGPT, but Wan has set up an anonymous form that I do not have access to that I want you to go fill out and tell us whether you're using ChatGPT. And the idea here is that as I grade your exams, I'm going to mark whether I think it's ChatGPT or not, and then we'll, see, we'll, we'll do a matchup to see, to see who, who gets it right or whether I'm right or not. Okay? Again, you do not lose points if you use ChatGPT. You, well, hold on. If you use ChatGPT and, and sorry, whether you write it or not, whether you're using ChatGPT, if you say the wrong things, like HStore helps making analytical workloads run faster, you will lose points. OK? So, so again, it's 2023. It, you know, ChatGPT is not going away. This is the future. Start learning how to use it correctly, OK? You're not OK with this? I, again, this is the future. <laughs> I don't, what, what did I tell you? Do you, you disagree? Do you disagree? This is the future. I agree with you. That this is a <laughs> it's not going to get everything correct, right? Like I said, it's going to up. It's your job to go through and, and figure it out. So the alternative was I was going to have either ChatGPT write the exam, or sorry, write the response, and then give you guys, give you that to mark it up to see like where it's wrong. Right? But I figured, let's start with this one first, OK? <laughs> and I said, the, the form is anonymous. I don't see it. I won't look at it. And, you know, and, and then I'll, I'll hand my results over to Wayne, and, and he'll, he'll cross-check, OK? All right, and then today's, today's lecture is about Velox. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we'll have another guest lecture in class. We'll do the, the same setup we had before with DuckDB um, to talk about Redshift. And that'll, be, that'll finish it off for the semester, OK? Any questions about any of these things? OK. Cool. All right. Um, all right, so today's lecture is about a framework called Velox. Or if you watch the videos, the European guys say Velox. I, I say Velox. Um, I don't know. What, they might be correct. I don't know. So the first thing I'm going to point out, though, is uh, Facebook or Meta. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to say Facebook a lot, even though they, because they changed their name. It's just hard to, hard to break a habit. Um, even though Facebook. Or, Facebook is not a, like a cloud 
service company, in the way that Google is or Amazon. Uh, Microsoft certainly morphed into that. Um, they have made significant contributions to database systems uh, since, since their beginning in the, in the late 2000s. Um, but one of the key differences about, I think, Facebook versus Google, like Google had all these, these list of systems that I talked about. Um, Facebook has actually been, done a great job at actually open sourcing a lot of its work in a way that Google hasn't. Um, I think the one thing I mi we missed maybe from the list of systems from, uh, from Google was LevelDB, which then they then open sourced and Facebook took and ran with it, but we'll cover that in a second. So the nice thing about Facebook is, again, they're not in the business of trying to sell you cloud services, although they, potentially they could have become like another Google, um, but they didn't, they didn't do that. Right? They're worried about the metaverse. Right? But, and so they open source a lot of their stuff. Uh, so this listing here, these are the ones I, I, I could think of that were uh, major database system projects at, at Meta um, that, get, again, almost all of these are, 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 are open source. And so, like I'm saying, so they don't sell these as a cloud service, but these have had significant influence in the, the database industry. So in particular, uh, Cassandra has, has, there's bits and pieces, well, Datastax is sort of the Cassandra company but bits and pieces of this are, are showed up in, in FaunaDB, and Cassandra, the Cassandra API has been uh, rewritten by ScaliaDB, that was like a C++ version of this. Actually, who here, who here didn't know Cassandra came from Facebook? Everyone knows this, or you didn't know, right? So the guy that wrote Cassandra wrote it for the mail service in like the late 2000s, 2008, uh, and then they realized they didn't actually want to use it because it was, it, was it was a combination of ideas from, from Google Big Table and Amazon Dynamo. They realized they didn't even use it, so they just open sourced it. They said, here it is. And they never actually even used it internally. Right? But they, like, they wrote Cassandra. Hive, we've, we've covered. RocksDB is a fork of, of Google's LevelDB. And what's the very first thing they do when they took LevelDB? They got rid of MMAP, right? And that's, that's in RocksDB. And the, here's a list, list of companies that either are uh, derived from it, embedding it, forks of it, Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, lot, a lot of systems are, are using um, RocksDB. So in particular, Cockroach started off using RocksDB, and again, it's an embedded uh, key value store, but you can build a larger system on top of it. They eventually rewrote their own uh, key value store called Pebble to get off of RocksDB, but like, this is a good starting point for many people. Um, Presto, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on today. WebScale SQL was a sort of a fork of MySQL to, to clean some things up. It was a combination of like, Facebook, I think Tencent, or one of the, one of the, chi the Chinese uh, tech companies, that, that sort of fizzled out and died. Gorilla, Berengi was a, um, a time series database. Log device was a, a log database, and then VLOX, obviously, we care about. Um, so of these, the only one that's not open source is Scuba. This is an internal in-memory analytical system for of how they do telemetry or uh, on uh, like uh, sorry, how to do analytics on internal telemetry that they collect from, um, like from their own services. For whatever reason, this is not open source. Now, a bunch of these other ones are also dead. Uh, like these are the ones that like that, that they're open source, but they, they don't they're not actually uh, the open source project is basically dead. But RocksDB, Cassandra, and Presto are in Hive are, are, are major systems. Um, so again, you may not think of Facebook as a database company. But they've, done, they've done a lot of work in this space. And even today, they run still the largest uh, MySQL deployment in, in the world. It's, it's massive. Like the core like Facebook thing that old people use, like you don't need the covers, that's, that, that's all MySQL. All right, so today we're talking about Velox. And this is actually a super hot topic. Uh, you might have seen this in the news, but just a week ago, IBM acquired uh, Ahana, which was a spinoff out of Facebook uh, that for, for Presto DB that was, that was using uh, Velox. Right, so this, this, this space is very active now, and IBM just bought, bought it, and they're in the game too. Okay, so Facebook meta, obviously they collect a lot of data. Right? There's the, there, again, there's the, all the, the data they collect from all people using Facebook, and then there's the, the internal telemetry from all their services, plus I think they own Instagram and a bunch of other, other services. So they, they have a lot of data. And so what they found in, uh, is, is they discussed in the Velox paper, that over the years, um, 
they have found that a bunch of their internal teams have been building essentially redundant tools to, to, to analyze this data, right? There was like the presser team building one thing and there was another team building other stuff, right? And so this, this fracturing of, the, of, their, of their tool set of the, these internal database systems caused a lot of wasted, wasted time and effort being spent on re-implementing the same thing over and over again. Right, they talked about how they did a survey of uh, a bunch of the tools and they found like 20, 12 different implementations of substring that were all doing things slightly different because right, of how they handled nulls, exceptions, uh, whether they started with zeros or one offsets. Right? And so Meta then basically said, okay, well, instead of having to have everyone optimize their own individual, these individual systems, let's go build a a single framework that all these, these systems could then use so that the engineering effort could be, make, could, could be spent making that one framework really work really, really well uh, and do a really good job on that and not worry about you know, dividing, dividing the effort across multiple teams. Right, so this is a, I would say this is not unique to Meta. I think this occurs oftentimes in, in a bunch of different companies. Um, and this is partly due because the, the way you get uh, promotions at tech companies is is sort of um, you know it's based on your contribution uh, to the company. But if you're you're doing backend infrastructure engineering, like it's not like you put out a new product and then you you know show revenue go up, right? So you show by like okay, if I lead a team that builds a system that ends up being used, right? That's how you get promoted. And then you move on to build the next thing, and then you worry about whoever comes behind you to, to maintain it. So that's why these, these, a lot of these tech companies have these built a lot, a lot of their own internal systems. So it seems like crazy. Why do you do this when there's existing tooling? Um, is because the the way the promotions are sort of set up is is to is, you know you get a benefit or you, you get you get advancement by building systems. But like when we discussed with Databricks and how they wanted to handle Spark SQL, that instead of trying to build an Uber system like a complete database system that replaced everything, because that would just sort of be infeasible. That you were better off building a smaller component, the engine itself, the execution engine, the query engine, and have that seamlessly integrate with what existing infrastructure already exists. And that'll have better, uh, by doing that, you have a better chance of, of providing the improvements that you want to have when, through this optimized framework versus uh, you're just saying, hey, here's my new database, you know, here's, here's the next one in the big list, everyone go use it, and because people don't want to give up what they're already using. So this is the backstory. This is the motivation for Velox, uh, and that it's a it's a, it's a it's a it's a library of components you would need to build a high performance single node query execution engine. So there's no notion of of workers on different nodes. There's no really notion of of shared disk storage, right? It's like really like a low level API for how you take vectors in from some input source, do some kind of operations on them, or execute things on them and then produce output. So it doesn't have a SQL parser. Uh, you have to give it already optimized physical plans. We'll talk a little bit about what, what they look like. There's no metadata catalog. Right? There's no, uh, you're not gonna be able to go say, like, what tables do I need to go look at? Like in Snowflake, if I want to access this table, it figures out what, what uh, micro partition files you need to read. None of that exists. You have to provide this to, to, to Velox if you want to use it. Another important thing is that there's not, oops, sorry, there's, sorry, there's not going to be a cost-based query optimizer. Again, something else has to provide the, the optimized physical plan. So you give the physical plan of, of these DAG, it tell you what to execute, and then crunches on it, and then spits it out wherever you want it, or passes it to sort of the next stage in, in the code, right? So again, this is, this is similar to what we saw in Photon. Like Photon itself has no notion of the cluster of machines uh, has no notion of how to send data from one, one node to the next. The, the, the outer shell, the thing that was, that was using Photon, was Spark itself. Same thing in Velox. We'll see this in Presto. Presto is going to handle the query optimization, the, the parse, SQL parsing and query optimization, the coordination of different nodes and sending data around. And then when it comes time to actually do like a join or scan a table, you're going to use the Velox runtime engine to do that efficiently, more efficiently than what it exists. So it's like, again, this is a toolkit that allows us to build a data processing platform like our own Spark, like our own uh, uh, Presto or you know, ClickHouse or whatever, whatever you want to use. BigQuery, Snowflake. So 
just going through the overview of what Velox provides, again, in the context of the things we talked about this semester, uh, there be, it's a push-based vectorized query processing. Again, they don't call that out explicitly, but when you read the paper and they discuss uh, this notion of a driver and task and so forth, that's, it's, it's, it's described in terms of being push-based rather than a, a pool-based with calling get next in the volcano model. They're going to be used pre-compiled primitives to do operations on expressions and within operators themselves on, on columns. Uh, they can do some cogen of expressions, the, the, the predicates, uh, but that's, that's in a experimental branch or experimental directory. It's not, you don't get it by default. For that one we'll discuss in a second, they're doing transpilation of the, of the expression program into, into C++ and then they fork exec, uh, the compiler. They're going to be uh, arrow compatible. Again, we haven't talked about exact details of arrow, but again, it think, of, think of like parquet, but for, for in-memory data. And the idea here is that you can send and retrieve data between Velox and some outer system using the arrow format without having to, to spend the time to do uh, expensive encoding or decoding. Because there's no query optimizer, uh, and there's no catalog, there's no statistics, uh, you, you don't want to assume that the, the query plan you're giving it is, is optimal. So they're going to support some runtime activity, activity uh, for when, when, you, when the operators start running. As far as I can tell, they don't do major reordering of the query plan. Like they can't switch around join orders, but they'll do some of the batch level optimizations that we saw in, in Photon. And then for joins, as far as I can tell, they, they support both sort merge join and, and hash join. Okay? So again, Velox is not a, a standalone system. It's a library that you use to build a new system or integrate to it an existing system. So these are the major components that, that they're going to provide you. So first is that it's going to have its own notion of, of a type system. So there's obviously the, the basic things like scalars, ints, floats, dates, and so forth. Um, then you can also support like, uh, complex types. Like if you want to have like time zone, or sorry, time sense with a time zone, you could represent that using their API. Now, you think of this like a user-defined type you would use in Postgres. Um, you have nested types like JSON. Uh, I don't know whether how, how they're doing shredding, if they're splitting things up the way we saw in Dremel or in Snowflake, uh, but they have a way to represent these things. And then the, the, as you're processing data through your operators, the, each operator is going to pass vectors to, to, you know, to, from one operator to the next. And again, we saw this in the DuckDB paper, or DuckDB talk last week, where uh, Mark was talking about there's different types of vectors you can pass on. Like there's like the flat ones, there's the dictionary encoding ones, there's the, the, constant, um, the constants ones. So since they're trying to be compatible with Arrow, Arrow only has dictionary encoding. So they would only have dictionary encoding and vectors or flat, flat buffers, flat vectors. And so they extend Arrow because the, the real data oftentimes you, you want to use these other encodings. So they support the, the, the delta encoding that we talked about. They support the RLE. And if you need to then have Velox talk to an external, external system or framework that expects Arrow, they do have ways to convert those vectors into the, the, you know, the default dictionary encoding that, that, uh, that Arrow provides. The expression engine we'll talk about in, in a second, but this is a way to do vectorized expression evaluation uh, using more or less what look like compiler optimization. So they'll compile the expression tree into a, sort of, they flatten it down to like a, like a program using their IR, and then they do passes on it as if it was a compiler to do like constant folding and uh, uh, common sub-expression sub, sub elimination. They have a function API that you can implement, uh, you know, the other built-in functions you'd want in, in, your, in your database system. Again, think of this as like, in Postgres, there's all these built-in functions that come with the system when it's shipped to you, like to do substring, for example. So the idea here is that there's an API that you could then hook in uh, if you're using Velox to add the functionality that you want. So when they when when Facebook had a, you know, when they had uh, they added Velox to Presto, Presto had already a bunch of functions that didn't come get shipped with the default Velox. They could re-implement those those built-in functions using uh, the API. And they they have a way to support either a, a Vector processing or a row by row processing based on how the, the data system expects things to happen. And again, this is for the data system developers, not for uh, the application developer. For operators, they have this, all the standard stuff we talked about this semester. 
scans, projections, filters, joins, right? There's nothing really fancy there. They're using, again, push-based model with, with vectorized uh, ex, uh, query processing model. For the storage, they have connectors that allow you to talk to, to different storage systems, HDFS, S3, Google Cloud Storage, whatever you want. And then the adapters allow you to do uh, encoding or decoding or serialization, deserialization to the different formats like, uh, like Parquet, Arrow, Orc, the things we talked about this semester. Then lastly, there's the resource manager that's going to do uh, the buffer pool management and, uh, and, and thread pools. Right? Again, so this would be everything right below the query optimizer, down below to the storage layer. This, this is what, where Velux fits in. So I want to go through uh, some, of the, some of these more, a bit more detail. So again, Velux is just this, the library. It doesn't own data, same way that Photon didn't own data. They don't have their own proprietary format the way Snowflake did. Um, and so instead, again, that you, they expose an API that you as a data system developer can, in, can implement against to expand, extend the, the functionality of, of the database system. So again, you can talk to different storage systems, S3, HDFS, you can do different formats, Parquet, Orc. They have a thing called Dwarf, which is uh, the paper they mentioned is their, their sort of extension or extended version of Orc. Um, then I don't remember the paper mentions this, Alpha. I don't think it does, but in a public talk, uh, Facebook has mentioned Alpha. Alpha is going to be the new, uh, a, a new Parquet, new Orc. Um, and the goal is to get this to be an open source format, like Parquet and Orc as well. And so one of the things that Alpha does that, that Orc and Parquet don't do is the ability to extract metadata about columns without having to deserialize the entire catalog. So in Orc, if I want to know if, what, is the column, what is the type of this particular column, one column, I can't just go get the metadata just for that one column. I've got to deserialize the entire metadata in the footer, then figure out the thing I'm looking for. So if I have 1,000 columns, but I only need information about one, in Orc, you have to deserialize the entire thing. Or in the case of, uh, and actually for both of these, they don't, they don't expose the dictionary to, to the upper parts of the system, the, like the engine itself. So if you want to start doing things like just tell me whether this, this key actually even exists. You can't just look in the dictionary and figure out whether the key even exists for some column. You've got to deserialize them, then do examination. So the idea is that you can do direct lookups into the dictionary. So again, this is, it's not open source yet. We did talk to them last week about this. Um, but this, and I, I don't know whether it's going to always be called alpha, but this is going to be the, the new version of, of like Parquet that, that Facebook is hoping everyone's going to use. And, and Velox supports it already. Much of this we've already said before. Again, the internal representation between operators is always going to be vectors. And at a high level, it is based on Apache Arrow, but it's an extension of it to support additional compression schemes that, uh, that Arrow doesn't need to support. And then the paper mentions that, oh, you know, we're talking to the Arrow people. We're hoping to get this merged. Um, as far as I know, this is still sort of, uh, sort of up in the air. So the optimizations they're going to do, uh, there's the lazy material, vector materialization. The idea here is that I don't have to actually populate a vector until I actually need it when you're doing processing between operators. There's the, the hyperstyle, the German style string storage that we saw from DuckDB. I'll show what that is in a second. And then the, the out of water writes and population, the idea there is that instead of, instead of having to write exactly the data in a vector in the way that it, was, that, it, like, that it comes in, like for this offset right in here, I can actually write ahead of time in a, to different locations. And I obviously have to make sure that the offsets match up. Uh, but this is sort of bending the rules of what, of what you what you would expect to be done, which is okay actually because it's a relational database system. You don't the ordering actually doesn't matter. So this string storage actually is is is, is pretty clever. And as my PG student Matt pointed out on Slack, we actually used to do the same thing in Noise Page, right? and then DuckDB mentioned they did this as well. And the basic idea here is that when I have a string, uh, instead of just storing the the size of the string and then and then the actual string itself, or a portrait to the string, what they're going to do is that you're going to store the size of the string, and then a preview or prefix of the string, and then if the string is small enough in the string itself. So here when I have the size, that's me four bytes, so 32 bits. Then I have a, a four byte prefix, so four characters, so assuming it's ASCII. And then in this case here, because the string is less than, uh, less than 16 bytes, I'll store the, the full string there. So now when I do a lookup, 
in, in, you know, when I'm scanning along the column, I would obviously know the size, but then I would have the prefix, and then in some cases I would, I'd have the full string right there, and I don't have to de dereference it to go get it, because it's right there. Right? So you, instead of storing the string as uh, like a four bytes for the size, and then you know, 16 bytes for, for the pointer, or eight bytes for the pointer, um, I'll spend a little more time in some more space. And I think it's, this should be eight bytes, right? Not, not 16. Yeah. I still think there's only two You only need if you have like the key there. What's that? Because you only have the rest of it. Oh, you don't even have the full, you don't have the rest of it? Okay. Uh, why is it size four? Why, why four bytes for why, this? Why is four in five? Yeah. This should be five for the size? No, 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 I mean, why does four is four in five? Oh, yeah, it should be five. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Let's just fix this now, sorry. So <laughs> the size is five, and I get rid of Andy, and it should be eight bytes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. Make sure the recording still works. I think, you know, I think we're good. Okay. All right, so. It's 16 bytes, four bytes for the size, size is five, thank you. Uh, then you have the prefix, it's, it's, it's four bytes, four characters, because it's assuming it's ASCII. Then you have the remaining string, right? If you have something longer, um, like this, you'd have the size, 17, you still have the prefix, but now inside of the eight byte payload here, you actually have a pointer to the, the full string. And what's cool about this is that there's some functions where you can, well, the idea is like if, if I'm doing a scan, like I'm trying to find where, you know, where a string equals or, or starts with WAN. If I just check the prefix, I know I don't have a match. So I don't have to dereference the whole thing and check anything else. So that's beautiful. Uh, and then it's, so, so it avoids me having to follow this thing. And then in some cases also too, for some, uh, for some string functions, I, I may not even have to go even check the, the rest of it as well. Right? Like if I, if I need the substring and I only need the first four characters of the string, even though the string might be super, every string might be super long, I can, I can produce the result just by looking at the, the prefix. Right? Again, arrow doesn't do this. Uh, this is something that, that, that again, would not be compatible with arrow, but again, for their, their environment, in most cases, this, this is a huge win. Again, DuckDB does this, this as well. We used to do this in our system. The hyper guys do a really good job of like using extra bits or extra bytes to, to pack additional information in to avoid having to do a, a dereference, dereference or follow, follow a pointer. Right? We saw this, a similar trick with, um, in their chained hash table where they would have 64-bit you know, pointers, but they would use the top uh, what, 16 bits to store a bloom filter, and then you use 48 bits for actual, the, the, the address that Intel x86 wants. So they always do a good job. They always do nice little tricks like this where they, they store some little stuff ahead of time uh, to avoid having to, to follow through pointers. All right, for the expression engine, again, they, as far as I can tell, my understanding of what they're doing is that they take the expression tree and they're going to flat it down into this intermediate representation of objects in C++ um, that, are, that are essentially going to be like a, an array of pointers and so now to execute the expression, you're just following along the function pointers to evaluate the, whatever was in the expression, right? Now, from what I can tell us to look in the code, the, the primitives that they're, they're for these, the function pointers are pointing to primitives, but they're not, they're not templated. So they don't have a, these, again, from my understanding look at the source code, they don't have like, here's the int32 version of inequality, here's the int64. They have these generic um, uh, primitives then at runtime, they're, they're, they're figuring out which one you actually need or not. Um, and again, I might be wrong about this, but, but they have another version of, of the code. Uh, they have another version of the expression engine that's in a separate branch. Well, they'll convert the flattened uh, IR that they generate up here into actual C++ code. And then they'll do a fork exec to compile the C++ code into uh, to machine code and then, and then invoke that and set it to evaluate the expression. Um, and they link, link it in. And then we saw this technique with uh, Haiku when we talked about query compilation. Um, Redshift does this as well. Uh, the, ver the first version of MemSQL did something very similar. But of course, they were doing, they were doing full query compilation. These guys are only doing this for, for expressions. 
And the paper talks about how like if you, you, wanna, you only want to do this for queries that you know are going to be running all the time or, and, and going to take a long time. Like cause this, in this case here, the compiler, the focus deck might take like 10 seconds for the compiler to finish. Contrast this with like with the hyper approach. They were using the LLVM, which is you know, much more, well, they, they were a bunch, bunch of different tricks, but they would use the LLVM and do that compilation in memory without having to do the fork exec. And then produce the, the, you know, the, the library, the shared object that you didn't link into the, to the program itself. All right, so for query adaptivity, um, they have uh, the, the major three checks that they have are predicate reordering. I'm missing a citation, but there's, there's a predicate reordering is a common technique that's often used uh, to figure out the, the trade-off between how long does it take to evaluate a predicate versus how selective it is. And so there's this balance. You, if something could be super selective, meaning like filter out most of the tuples, but if it takes a long time to compute, then maybe you don't want that to be the, most, the, the first thing you're checking. Um, and there was paper worked on in the 1990s where you actually could move predicates you know, up and down the entire query plan. They're just reordering within the actual filter operator itself. So they have a simple formula that says to try to evaluate the selectivity cost versus the time cost and figure out, and they, they do this at runtime. They do column prefetching where if you know you're going to be reading, you're processing one column, but you know you're going to need to read another one, they can do asynchronous IO, start fetching in the next column you're going to need while you're still processing the, the first one. All right, and that's a standard technique that, that is widely used. I wouldn't necessarily call that uh, adaptivity other than if it's tied to the predicate reordering. If you know that you're going to be evaluating a column with some, pred you know, the first predicate evaluates this column, but then the next column is going to, the next predicate evaluates a different column, you go ahead and prefetch that second column while you're processing the first one. And the last one is doing, uh, trying to elide ASCII checks because those have a higher cost than, uh, sorry, those are cheaper than if you do, if you assume everything is, is UTF-8, right? I mean, this is the same batch level uh, adaptivity we saw in the case of, uh, in Photon, where they were trying to recognize as you're reading the data, oh, this is actually all ASCII data, so let me not do the, the more expensive UTF version of it, let me use the ASCII version, right? Because you assume everything's always going to be uh, one byte characters. But another, another trick they also do is that they know that the, Based on whatever the, the operator is or whatever the expression is trying to do, if you don't need to, uh, if you're allowed to overwrite the data that's in the vector as you're processing it, then you don't have to allocate new memory. So they call this the, the buffer reuse. So for example, if I know that I'm, uh, I'm running a string function that's going to uh, take a substring of, of, of a four character uh, string and to convert it to a three character string, then instead of just allocating a whole other buffer to put the output, then I'll just store the, the result of my, of my rewrite back into the, the buffer where it came from, and I pass that along up in my query plan. So I avoid the additional memory pressure that the malloc calls to allocate that memory. Uh, so, in this, so these are the two graphs on the paper here. So this is just showing the performance difference between the ASCII versions of standard string functions versus the UTF, UTF version, right? And the, the difference is quite significant. This is why you want to do this, this sort of activity. And most data, uh, whether people even think about it or not, most data is going to be ASCII. If you think of all the log files that these systems are generating, if people aren't, you know, people aren't putting weird emojis in there, all right, it's going to almost always be ASCII. But yeah, I have one story. Uh, there was a Davis company, I can't say who it is. Uh, they had their whole system crashed because someone stored like the poop emoji uh, and it percolated far enough in the system where they finally hit one component of the storage layer that didn't, didn't know how to handle you know, uh, emojis. And it took the whole thing down. And they had to go in manually, pat, you know, patch the, uh, the poop emoji with something else to make it all work. Um, but again, you should, write, you should write your systems to handle UTF-8, but most of the time it's going to be ASCII. And if, if you can avoid using the, the more expensive versions of this, uh, these checks, uh, it's a big difference. And then here, again, they're measuring the, the runtime uh, run per row in nanoseconds. The, the, again, avoiding ASCII is a big win, but you still get about 50% improvement also, too, on top of that, if you can reuse the buffers. Because, again, it's, it's not having to call it malloc, which is always a, a big deal. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about how they're using uh, Velox. And I know there was an example they talked about. Uh, <laughs> there was a project called Spark CPP, which is basically like 
the photon stuff we saw with uh, in Databricks, where they're replacing the, the, the Java based runtime and the Scala based runtime of, of Spark with Velox. Um, so we've already started to cover that. I want to talk about uh, Pratissimo a bit. Um, so again, Presto DB is the, think of this as like Facebook's version of Dremel that we talked about, where it was like this query engine that could run on top of disaggregated storage. Um, so the, the full story of, of, of Presto is Facebook started Presto, and it was called, it used to be called just Presto, and then there was a, there was a fork, there was, there, and, and there was Presto DB, and then Presto SQL. And I think the reason why there was a fork, because a lot of people were working on Presto, but then Facebook was getting kind of weird with the ownership of it, even though it was supposed to be open source. Um, and so the, the guys at Starburst, which is a spinoff of, spin of Astrodata, or Teradata, Astrodata went by Teradata, the spinoff of Teradata, they changed the name uh, of Presto into Trino. So Trino is the fork of Presto. And then, sorry, they had a fork that was called Presto SQL. Facebook then made Presto DB. So you had Presto DB and Presto SQL, and obviously that's confusing. So then the Presto SQL guys renamed theirs to Trino. But at the end of the day, it, it is just Presto that has its uh, uh, provenance from the, the Facebook project. And then since then, uh, Facebook converted the, the, the sort of stewardship of the Presto DB project to like the Linux Cloud Foundation. I think it's like you know, another version of the Apache Foundation. Uh, it's not my problem. They get, let them deal with it. Anyway, so Presto DB is the one that's still tied to Facebook. Trino's the one that's, that's, that's separate now. So again, just like in Databricks, they went through uh, and they re replaced the core runtime engine, the kernels of the operators and the expressions, all the stuff we just talked about with to use Velox and invoking it through JNI in the same way that, that, that Databricks did the Photon. And so the paper talks about how like, there's the core functionality that Velox provides, like, like the built-in things that it supports, like reading and writing HDFS and, and uh, handling, you know, encoding and decoding from Parquet and ORC. But to make it uh, be completely compatible with, with Presto DB, they had to go use the API that Velox exposes to you to then all the, the built-in functions to, that, that Presto DB expects. And I don't know the status of Pratissimo. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's actually open source yet, but I know there's, there's, it's being used by Intel, being used by ByteDance, the TikTok type people. Like, th this is actually a real thing. So you think, okay, well, if Presto DB is using Velox, and, this, and, and so it was also to the paper reports like a 2x performance improvement or 2 to 4x performance improvement of PrestoDB using Velox versus the, the Java stuff, right? And in public talks, they, they make the same arguments that the Databricks guys did where to really eke out the, the you know, if you want to stick with Java, you really got to have people that really know the internals of the JVM and can hack on it and, and make it basically uh, abuse the JVM to get like bare metal performance you would get with C++. And that you're better off just writing the engine in, in C++ and using JNI to hook into the, the overall system. Right? That's the same argument Databricks made before. The Trino guys disagree with this approach. Um, and this is from, I think, a podcast they did last year where the, they talk about, you know, would Trino, being, would Trino make a, 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 a vectorized C++ engine to integrate it with the same way that Velox did or, or Databricks did? Um, and then they said, they say, the direction of Trino, while still including bare metal performance improvements of the JVM, was still instead focused on not wasting time with suboptimal query plans before or during runtime. Right, so they're saying they're going to stick with Java, but then rather than, than trying to spend the effort to rewrite the core engine with C++, like something like Velox or Photon, that you're better off making the query optimizer better and, and, and having better runtime additivity to... Uh, Avoid having crappy query plans. So who's right? All right, so you have, you have the Velox people say, Java sucks. Let's rewrite everything C++ or Rust. Um, then you have the Trino guys say, no, no, no. We're OK with using the JVM. Let's make the query optimizer better. He says both. <laughs> You say you use JVM as an optimizer, like what, sorry? Optimizer service, Orca. Oh, you use the JVM as an optimizer as a service? Yeah. Uh, what, is that? what do you mean by that? Like for the query optimizer? Yeah. 
And then, like, do they have recruiting? Like, Green Club? Yeah. Well, Orca's a C++. You mean Calcite? Yeah. Okay. All right, so he says both. I'm not sure what you're saying. Both. You said both. Yeah. All right, so raise your hand if you think uh, Velox is right. Wait, Abby? <laughs> if, 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 raise your hand if you think Trina is right. Raise your hand if you think these two guys are right, and the answer is both. The answer is both. They're both right, right? But the question is, like, what's easier? Probably rewriting in C++. Yes, that's, that's the irony of this. That, like, it seems like a major undertaking, but rewriting in C++ is probably the easier task because, like, from engineering. Because, know what makes, like, optimizer good, isn't it? Could, could, yeah, because, like, yeah, so her statement is, well, it's, it's basically a, uh, it's an unending quest to make your optimizer good and because it, it's super, super hard. Whereas this one, you, you kind of, there's a, there's a path forward which you know you, 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 you know what you need to do. So they're both right. Uh, which one is easier? I think, again, this is easier. Let's see how far they get with this, right? But he's absolutely right. Like if you have a crappy query plan, if like you can have the fastest C++ engine in the world, you, 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 know, you know, if you get a crappy join order, who cares, right? Because you're still going to be in, in, you know, in that exponential time. So again, th this is a good example. Of like, again, as uh, hopefully the main takeaway you get from this class is like, you have two different opposing views, and you can sort of understand the trade-offs between one versus the other. Now, there's other sort of aspects of this discussion that like we we're not privy to. Like, you know, maybe maybe like this company only has a bunch of Java developers anyway. So if you if you don't have any C plus plus, you got to go hire them. Right, and that costs time and money. But like maybe you have, I don't know, like who's best? Maybe you have your own German, right? <laughs> that, that could, could do query optimizer, build a query optimizer. So you put them on that, then that's better, better spent, they're better off doing that than, uh, than you are writing some of those engines. So like, and there's other things, other engineering decisions you have to make beyond just like what is easier and how much time it takes, right? So again, I, I like this. I, you can read something this because there's clear two different directions you could go. And the, well, the Ahana guys got bought by IBM, so we'll see how that works out for them. But um, the Trino guys, they, they've raised a ton of money too, right? So they could, like, you know, they haven't raised as much money, and then I don't think their valuation is as high as Databricks, Databricks but um, they, they have a lot of money. They, they could pursue anyone, and they're deciding to go with the Korean Muzzer. Okay, so I want to talk about now um, some additional uh, projects that may have gotten mentioned throughout the semester. I don't think I spent time on this, um, but I, I just, again, I was to mention it now so you, so you get exposed to this, and you, cause this is the future of where, where these systems are going. Um, and I'll talk about then two other projects that look and smell a lot like uh, Velox that are, that are considered viable alternatives. So the first is this project called Substrate. Um, and as far as I know, this is like one dude that's sort of like spearheading this. He's the creator of Apache Drill he, uh, and, and Apache Arrow. He was the co-founder of Dremio. So I, I, I don't know if he's independently wealthy, but th this, this is his hobby right now. This is what he's working on. And so the idea with Substrate is that in the same way that the sort of the, 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 the database community, at least in, in industry, uh, you know, for, for these data lake uh, systems. We've sort of galvanized around these open source formats like ORC and Parquet and potentially Alpha in the future. In the same way that there's an open source specification for how to define what the data looks like, there should be an equivalent specification for what query plans look like. So we haven't really talked like, but like you know, there, there are these, this notion of what are called federated databases where it's like a middleware system where you write one query to it and then it could talk to a bunch of different databases and it could take your query and convert it to another query that like, or like a MongoDB query or like a, like a Postgres query. And it could take the results and put them, you know, combine them together and produce a single answer. So, so it's a way to sort of integrate different databases in a way that they weren't really meant to um, before. And you can sort of say the connector API that, like, that, that Presto and Trino support, you can write you know, Presto queries that then connect to Postgres and retrieve data from Postgres and pull it up. Right? But what is Presto actually doing? It's converting the, 
whatever query plan that Presto generates in, in, on the inside, converts that to SQL that Postgres can understand and produces the results that way. So instead of having to do that conversion from one SQL dialect or one API dialect to another one, with Substrate, the idea is that you could have a single physical plan in a standard format be used on any possible different database system as long as they support uh, a Substrate API. And so it could either be the entire query plan itself, or if you know that you need to retrieve data from Postgres and Mongo, you could take the Substrate plan that you have and then pull out portions of it that you then send down to Postgres and Mongo to do like basically predicate pushdown or join filtering pushdown, whatever you want to do, and then combine the results. So as far as I know, I don't think any system uh, is making full use of this just yet. I think it's still uh, in the works. Uh, I think there's prototypes that are out there. Um, but to me, this is, this is the right way to go. This is the clear direction. This, this is sort of what's coming next. Of, in the same way, again, Parquet and Orc, you, you would have a system that supports Substrate. And it would allow you to integrate into a sort of big data ecosystem in a way that existing systems don't do right now. Like Postgres is an island on, on itself. It doesn't know about other database systems. I mean, farm data wrappers can, 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 can make that sort of work, but it doesn't natively talk to other database systems. Whereas like something like Substrate could, could make this happen. So I think you'll, you'll see a lot more of this in, in the future. All right, so two projects that look like Velox as, as considered alternatives are uh, Data Fusion and, and Polars. So, what is Data Fusion? It's a almost exactly like Velox. It's extensible vectorized execution engine to build a, a full-fledged database system that's meant to work operate on Apache Aero data, and to make G happy, it's written in Rust. So, Data Fusion provides more of a, a, a complete end-to-end -end system than Velox. Like Velox didn't have a SQL parser, didn't have a query optimizer, doesn't have a catalog. In Data Fusion, it does have a SQL interface. It does have a query optimizer. As far as I can tell, it's not cost-based. It's just doing you know, uh, heuristic-based rules. Um, they also expose a data frame API if you want to operate it on, like, using a pandas syntax. But again, this could be, it could, this, this could be the core engine that you could build a larger system, system around. And so the, the probably most famous example of using uh, Data Fusion as, as this core engine is InfluxDB. They announced a new engine written, written in Rust two or three years ago called IOX, right, that uses, uh, that uses Data Fusion on the inside. I think it was originally written in Go. I think that this is their third version of the system they built. Long story short, they, they started off using SQL, then they abandoned SQL. I told them it was a bad idea. I'm not saying they changed because of me, and then they went, came back to SQL. Um, and they did use MMAP, and I told them that was a bad idea, and they got rid of that too. I'll take credit for that one, not using SQL. Um, and then Cerise to be and CNOS, I think they're out of China, and this one is like a, like a, like a OLAP engine as well. I think these two might be companies, this one might be a, a hobby project. And obviously, InfluxDB is a big company. So again, if you want to have, this is, again, same idea as Velox, they have an API, you can implement, extend it, but they also support additional things from, uh, that Velox doesn't have out of the box. All right, the next one is Polars. Now, you may be thinking, okay, wait a minute, is this, isn't this the exact same slide? And the answer is yes, because as far as I can tell, it's, a, it's not the same code, but it provides all the basic same features as, uh, as Data Fusion. It's written in Rust, it's a stencil vectorized execution library for Apache Arrow data. Um, they have a SQL interface, they provide data frames, and a query optimizer. Now, I will say one difference is that in, in the case of data fusion, they're sort of pushing the SQL route more. In polars, they're pushing data frames more. Right? They have a command line interface. It, it, it's, it's not compatible with pandas, but it's an alternative to pandas. Um, and DuckDB is awesome. DuckDB talks to all these things, right? Like you can read and write data from, from polars and, and, and data fusion just fine, right? Because it's all Apache Arrow. I can't find any system that actually supports this. Uh, there's a company called Polar Singles. They had a signals. They had a database called Arctic DB, but then that colli collided with something else. They had to rename it to Frost DB, but they're not using Polars. But the name of the company is Polars, and it's it's not good naming. Um, but that's that's their problem, not mine. Anyway, so again, this is another alternative to uh, to Data Fusion, another alternative to Velox. But the same idea applies. That it's an engine 
It's a library that you do to extend to build a, a larger system. And so the reason why I'm bringing all this up is that even though we just spent the entire semester talking about, hey, how do you, how do you build a high-performance OLAP engine, um, I think for this decade, we've reached the point where it's, I don't think it's advisable, other than if you want to build it for a hobby project or like a one-off thing, uh, if, if certainly if you're, if you're going to do a startup, it doesn't make sense to build an OLAP system from scratch anymore. Right? It doesn't even make sense to like fork ClickHouse or DuckDB. Um, that something like Velox provides all the functionality you, you need to have a modern OLAP system that we've talked about this entire semester, uh, and you should use that as a starting point rather than, than building everything from scratch. Right? And, and something like Velox also too, if with, you know, with ByteDance behind it, with Intel and, and other people, like if there's a lot of people working on the open source version of it, uh, and you just build the, the, your, your larger system around it, then as they improve the, the runtime kernels and, and, the, and the engine itself, you get all that benefit, assuming it's still compatible. So it's sort of like when Snowflake talked about how, or, or, or Dremel talked about how they decided not to build their own storage layer. They just used what, what the Colossus framework, that, uh, the file system that, that Google had on the inside. So as Colossus got better, the overarching system got better without making any changes. So in the same way, I think if you build your system around something like Velox, as Velox or whatever improves, your system gets better, and they, but you're spending all your engineering time on, on the upper parts surrounding it. So the query engines are getting commoditized. And I also, too, I'm not, saying, I'm not suggesting that like Snowflake go back and throw away all their code and switch over to Velox. Like, that, that'd, that'd be insane. You wouldn't do that, right? But I think the ship has sailed whether you could, you could build a viable system, at least for, for now, that was writing things from scratch to, to plus doing all the other stuff that actually you need to have, like you know, build, build the query optimizer, for example. So, so it's not to say also, too, that like, if you take this class, does that mean everything I've told you is obsolete? No, because you can go get jobs and work on the systems that do have money, like Snowflake and, and Redshift and Databricks, to, to build these things. It's just, again, if, if you're trying to build a new startup, I don't think you would want to write it from scratch. And I think the engineering effort to fork something like Click, ClickHouse would be a major undertaking, and it's not worth it. And that you're better off using something like Velox. And I have no connection to Facebook. It's not like they're, you know, they're paying me or anything like that. This is my opinion. And so if ex vectorized execution engines become commoditized, then what actually makes one system better than another? This goes back to the discussion of Trino versus uh, PrestoDB that the UI, UX, like the user experience of, of how people use your database system, like you know, the, the, web, the, the interface, what, what, what it's compatible with, like can you interface it with Python or so forth, and the, how good your query plans are, those are the things that, that are actually going to matter in the next decade. Not how fast you can do you know, uh, post based vectorized query execution, because everyone's doing that now. So I think, again, th th this, is, this is the big battle going forward. And that's why I think the, the Trino guys might be onto something. But you know, it's a trade-off between, and, and they, they certainly would have their own telemetry to say, you know, how often do you, do you generate a, you know, how often, how often are queries, uh, how far away they from the optimal query plan when they actually run? And is that always going to be uh, 4x better than what, Facebook sees by switching over to Velox, right? Again, and we, you know, we're database people. We can measure this. We can make it. We can make a make a decision based on that. Sure, I think like what if you need an index? It's not something Velox can do. <coughs> the question is, what if you need an index? This is not something Velox can do. Uh, like to to add the index or decide what index you need. I think first you'll need to add an index, and then you'll need to implement some like executors using that. Right, so the statement is, yeah, so, so the question is, or statement is, if you need to, like, assuming something has figured out what's the, what index you need, right, assuming that, that exists, then how do you integrate that in something like Velox? Well, it's, it's just another, like, you know, operator, right, they, they, they do an index scan instead of a, instead of a file scan. Yeah, they don't need to fork Velox then, in my No, I don't think you need to fork Velox, you just have, you, like, you have, you, in your, well, you would have your fork, yes, but, like, your, sorry. You're adding additional functionality. You're not. Um, 
Yeah, you're, it's, it's not a hard fork. You're just implementing us against their API. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say so I'm a fool cause I drink brew. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a flow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 48 gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>